All right, you guys. Uh, my name is Blaze. Today is February 29th, leap year day of 2024. Um, and I'm the uh, founder of Blue Chip Athletic Club podcast and Blue Chip Athletic Club itself, uh, where we'll discuss real fitness questions from real people every single week. Um, if you want to learn more about our program in general, please check out our virtual business card. We'll drop all of our links in there and it'll be in the description here for the video um, after this call. So without further ado, we're going to hop into uh, our chat today. Uh, first, before I get to that, a little quick background about me. I've been uh, all walks of life in my own health and wellness journey. I've been the guy who's 150 pounds soaking wet, trying to be a better athlete uh, in the game of lacrosse. And I've been the guy who's 230 pounds uh, and about to get kicked out of the uh, naval flight training for being almost too heavy for the ejection seat. So um, I've seen both sides, uh, weight gain, weight loss, athletic uh, improvement, all sorts of things. And along the way, I basically just figured out a couple of things that I wanted to kind of take away and deliver to you guys. Um, and that's achieving your dream body doesn't take over two hours of work. Uh, in a day, especially in the gym. It's more about understanding your body, listening to it and working to improve. Um, and now basically I train hard, but it's only about 45 minutes a day and I feel better than ever. Um, and it was really through educating myself, which I really hope to kind of bring to this group. And then hopefully you guys can share it with uh, anybody that you know that thinks we'll get that you think will get anything out of it. Um, and now I feel like I'm uh, as healthy as I've kind of ever been. Although standing next to an NFL player doesn't really help. So uh, <laughs> Here's where we're going to kind of get into our discussion today about shin splints. So uh, today we're going to talk about shin splints. Thanks a lot, Tim, for the uh, topic today. You made me do a nice deep dive into something that I didn't truly understand super well before this. So I'm hoping that I can kind of break it down for everybody here that's going to listen to this live and then also listen to it later on. So shin splints are basically going to be a uh, condition or syndrome kind of in the lower part of the leg, right below the knee as shown here in this photo, where your muscles, tendons, and bone tissue around your shin bone become inflamed. So it's the area of your lower leg that kind of gets really irritated, typically kind of happens right in this area. Um, we'll kind of talk about it a little bit more, but it's technical term is going to be the medial tibial stress syndrome, aka shin splints. I'm just going to call them shin splints all day. So uh, sorry for any medical professionals that don't like that, but we're going to keep it simple for everybody here. Um, so identifying shin splints. So you might have shin splints if you're somebody who has some pain on the inside of your lower leg and you feel sore after exercise. You may have tenderness, soreness, or pain uh, near the shin bone, or you have some swelling. Um, so shin splints can occur uh, from a variety of different things. Um, typically, it's going to come from some sort of an impact or impact training. Um, so I want to talk through a little bit of uh, these contributing factors or things that we can kind of talk about. I put air quotes around some of these things and I'll kind of go into why. So common causes for shin splints uh, would be excessive running. Um, I say excessive running in quotes because realistically it depends on who you are, right? So somebody who runs hundreds of miles in a, in a year or, you know, sometimes in a day, they've built up some resiliency in their body and fight off kind of the shin splints based on their training regimen um, and having like professional people that are working on their tissue and these types of things. So the difference in excessive running for somebody who's been sedentary and then decides to run a marathon tomorrow is very different from the guy who's been training guy or gal who has been training for ultra marathons for multiple years and has been in this kind of game for a bit. So I just want to make sure that that's super known. Uh, it's going to be dependent on the person and their own ability level. Um, next thing is going to be lack of support. Again, I say support and old worn out shoes. I kind of put those together. The reason for that is that there's people that run uh, without shoes at all. Um, and they find that, you know, there's a guy, I think his name's the barefoot sprinter on uh, his social media handles. And he basically does not wear shoes and he runs around a track and does like full workouts, programming, all those things without shoes. Um, what I'll say is that's not for everybody, but what he's done is he's been able to build up his foot strength all the way throughout his foot. So that that's not something that hurts him. And he trains in a way that's going to keep the adequate amount of support for what he's doing. So um, your lack of support may just be because you haven't adapted to that type of training. And then your old and worn out shoes may also be the case because you, you know, your foot has started to wear down in those shoes and you don't have the strength in your foot to be able to kind of, uh, take on the rest of that strain and stress. 
All right. So um, next thing is going to be a weakness in the lower part of the leg muscles. And we're going to kind of get into that a little bit more. But um, what this basically is going to be from is you're going to have not enough strength and a, a combination of muscles that are kind of around the shin bone and the tibia, as well as the muscles in your calves so that I can take the stress and strain off of you doing impact training. So all those loads in your lower foot that are coming from you running or you jumping or whatever that is kind of end up going into your shin and then impacting your skeletal system versus the muscular system that's going to kind of take over. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about where you could be weak and kind of ways to help in your lower leg. Um, I'm going to break this down into kind of three steps. Step one is going to be releasing the tissue. Step two is going to be to lengthen the tissue and step three is going to be to strengthen the tissue. So the two muscles, and I guess it's technically three that we're going to kind of talk about are going to be the tibialis anterior, which is going to be here along the front of the shin. And then the tibialis anterior muscle, sorry, the tendon, and then the muscle here along the front as well. So, and the calf is going to be another thing that we'll chat through. So, you know, what does this mean? Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to do a bazillion calf raises and then get there. Um, but what it is, is about addressing the imbalances or lack of uh, st stability in your muscles so that you're able to continue to run and train for the long haul. So without further ado, we'll get into it. Releasing the tissue. So I found this super sweet video and I'm actually going to drop it here in our links below that talk through a quick way that you can kind of start to see some effective change if you do have shin splints. Um, but basically it's talking about some sort of fascial release. So you can do foam rolling along the front of your shins. You can do scraping. Um, this is a really good tool. If you have just a normal spoon, um, the video kind of talks through like, Hey, if you rub down like coconut oil or some sort of like a, um, lotion or, you know, massage oil or something like that, it's going to help you kind of get that spoon across that fascia. Um, and then you can kind of release it based on the spot, like just below your shin. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can always ice and massage the area, which is going to be super beneficial for you to kind of get some of that uh, tension out of your shins. Because at the end of the day, because those the muscle is so tight, it's going to be taking all the impact into the bone and could end up causing problems down the line, like stress fractures. Next thing we'll talk about is lengthening the tissue. So if you want to lengthen your tissue, typically it's going to come from a couple different moves. These are just a few examples. There's plenty more out there. Um, if you kneel down and you basically try and sit back on your feet, um, you may notice that you can get your butt like really close to your feet or touching your feet. And if you're somebody who struggles in the lengthening category, you may be somebody whose butt and like hips are like way up here, creating like a larger angle between your legs and your, uh, your butt, which is indicative of your shins being super, super tight which is not allowing you to have that motion. So that's part of it uh, could be some mobility that kind of exists or lack thereof in your shin. The other thing that you can do, and this one isn't quite in, as intense as it needs to be for you, you can kind of enter into this kind of bear crawl stance here and you can press, notice how his feet are flat against the ground. You can press into the floor with your hands and then stretch across the front of your shins and then create a little bit of a space there for you as well. So. A couple different things. Um, I use a foam roller as well. I'll kind of sit typically like the top photo and I'll throw the foam roller kind of under just below my knee and I'll roll forward and back. And then I'll try and sit back on my heels as well. Another way to kind of get that stretch in and also promote a little bit of fascial release with the foam roller. All right. Last but certainly not least here is going to be strengthening the tissue. Step three. Um, so we talk it through a couple different types of moves. Um, calf raises are one big one that you can kind of try and address. Um, what isn't shown in here and is shown in the video. And like I said, I'll drop it in the links, but when, um, you do the calf raises, you can go straight up and down, which is great off an elevated surface, but you can also try and like come up and then almost out to the side or almost out to the other side, or even like in a or circular pattern. What that's going to do is it's going to promote your musculature to work, not just in one plane, but in multiple planes. And it's going to help you strengthen that calf, not in just one dimension. Because realistically, if you're running, um, let's say you step in a hole or something else happens, like there's going to be other pieces of the body that need to be able to take on that stress. And it's really helpful to kind of work, not just 
right along the backside of the calf, but also on the outer and inner heads as well. The other thing that you can do, you can squeeze a tennis ball kind of between your feet and also do calf raises. It's been super effective in helping people kind of promote some strengthening of the tissue along the backside of the leg. The other exercise that I really, really love is the tib raise or tibialis raise. Basically what you do is you bring your feet from this like position where you're flat and my butt's actually against the wall. I know it's kind of hard to see, not the best photo, but you'll basically leave your feet flat on the ground and then you'll pick your toes up. And what that's going to do is it's going to help promote strengthening on the front side of your shin, which is going to be those uh, couple muscles that we talked about earlier, the tibialis anterior, um, which are going to help promote strengthening up there. And then that's going to help take some of that impact load as well along the way. So a uh, big question that, you know, is asked when it comes to shin splints is, can you still exercise? Um, you 100% can still exercise, but just realize that life is full of trade-offs and this is no different, right? So you have to answer the question for yourself based on kind of where you are and how severe your pain is. So what I don't want you to do in this discussion is be like, oh, I'm just going to use this excuse to fall off the wagon because you can make any sort of excuse as to why you're not exercising in a day, you're too tired, you're too hungry, you're sick, your shins hurt, whatever you have shin splints. Um, but what you can do is what you you can adapt your training program to meet you where you are and be able to train effectively for your specific situation. Um, because at the end of the day, if you're making an excuse for not exercising um, one or two times, it's probably a mistake or, you know, something that's kind of a one off. But when that mistake becomes a habit, uh, that habit kind of becomes a decision over time. So what I don't want you to do is, you know, get into this hole of like, oh, I have shin splints, so now I can't exercise. And then you lose the mental win, you lose the routine, you lose all those other things, and then you kind of fall off the wagon. It's not really the goal. Uh, so don't be afraid to rest and pivot. Um, and it's okay to kind of address that weakness in that lower part of the leg consciously so you can help improve your pain over time. All right. When do you want to seek professional help? Um, I'll say, I'll caveat this, and I know I didn't even put it in here, but you should always not be, or excuse me, you should never be afraid to seek professional help from a uh, licensed MD. Um, if your pain doesn't improve within a little bit of self-care or, you know, after a few days, um, you should probably get an opinion or referral for PT. Those guys are going to be super helpful for you as well. Um, the other thing that, like I alluded to a little bit before is stress fractures are something that can occur if it goes untreated for a certain amount of time. So again, all that stress pounding that's going to happen on your shin, uh, if left untreated could end up affecting your musculature instead and your skeletal system versus just, you know, you having a sore lower leg from the impact. So let's talk, uh, ways that you can pivot. A um, couple of different things that you can do. You can lessen or lighten up your impact training. So for example, I've got a foot injury, but it actually, a lot of the uh, same type of things kind of have applied to me. So if instead you have doing, you know, burpees with a hop at the top or jump roping in your program or box jumps, I've shifted to doing, you know, burpees with no hop at the top or step ups versus box jumps. And then basically trying to find ways that I can still do the work but I'm doing the work to the best of my ability so that I can also promote the rest and recovery of that kind of um, issue. And in your case, or if anybody has this happening to them with shin splints, those are the same types of adaptations that you can make in your own training protocols as well. Next is going to be rest. Um, I know this is a, a loaded word, I'll say, for, uh, for when it comes to recovering. But resting can look different for everybody. Um, resting could look like going on a walk and doing some like active recovery. It could look like, um, you know, just training around that that weak area or that weak point. What I don't think it means is it doesn't mean it's just sitting on your couch and uh, putting your feet up and just kind of sitting there all day the way that people like traditionally think of rest. So don't be afraid to mobilize your tissue. Don't be afraid of going to get a massage. Don't be afraid of scalping if that's something that you're interested in. It's other ways that you can kind of start to find improvement where you're actually doing something about the issue versus just sitting there and waiting for it to magically get better when you're sitting there on the couch because that's totally not the goal too. Um, another thing that's been proven to work um, isn't something that I've personally tried is compression socks. 
Um, they're basically just going to help provide a little bit of support along your lower leg that are going to help you along the way. But most important, and I've said it, you know, a million times is the key to strength and staying healthy for as long as you can is your mobility. So the best thing that you can do is address it. Mobility is the key. It's always been and always will be. Um, you're strengthening when you can be strong through a long length and range of motion. It's going to help you bulletproof your body. I say this just to say, like, do not, do not, do not skimp on your mobility training. It's beyond important. Track how you do, record your form, uh, see how it's analyzed, and then start to make improvements over time because it's really going to make a huge difference in your training protocol. So that's all I've got for you guys today. Let me know if you have any questions, and we will see you guys in the next episode. See ya.